Hi and welcome. This is the Writers Room podcast, a podcast for writers and people who are interested in writing. My name is Sandeep and our guest for today is Nandini Nair. Nandini has been a journalist for 20 years. She's currently the literary and cultural editor with Open, a weekly news magazine in Delhi. She has previously worked with feature sections of the Indian Express and the Hindu. Nandini completed her master's of arts degree from Columbia Journalism School and a postgraduate diploma in journalism from Asian College of Journalism, Chennai. Welcome, Nandini. Welcome, Sandeep. Um, it's great to be here and I'm excited about your podcast. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I've been meaning to have this conversation with you for a while now. Um, we've been colleagues in a previous uh, previous encounter and right. uh, you know we've had such discussions in the past, but uh, I'm, I'm so glad we, we have this opportunity to delve deeper and you know, talk about things uh, that writers are interested in and things that um, that we we want to discuss uh, right. generally, right? So uh, perhaps we can start with with the question that lead us into the conversation is uh, what writing means to you and why write. Um, so just I'll start off by saying that I'm usually on the other side. I'm the one asking questions. Uh, so I feel a bit on the spot to be answering um, and. Friends who know me always say that I kind of answer questions with a question. So I will try not to do that this time and I will try and break out of the habit. Um, so very quickly, um, when you sent me this point about why do you write, um, I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine. She's also a journalist um, and she works, in fact, with NPR, the radio station in the mm. US. Um, and we were just like, she and I were talking about how Journalism is in this moment of flux, right? Um, fewer and fewer people are reading newspapers. Print journalism is sort of, you know, on its last legs. Um, everyone is an authority. Everyone has an opinion. Um, so you really wonder what's the future of journalism. And so she and I were talking about how we don't uh, are unsure about our future. And we were like, but we have very limited skills. <laughs> our one skill is taking words and threading it into a sentence. And we were both like, that's so sad if that's the only skill we have. <laughs> uh, and we were like, that's why we write because we really can't do anything else. Um, and of course we were being sort of facetious about it. Uh, but I do also believe that. Um, I think I am at my um, most confident when I'm at my laptop and I am sitting and writing. Um, it's the time when I sort of feel the cogs turning in a way which I just do not feel anywhere else. Um, mm. And it's this, this uh, feeling like um, it was funny because again, like I, every time I ask, uh, think about this question, I think about what auth other authors have written um, and have mentioned. So in fact, Shashi Tharoor, he said about how um, it's like a cow giving milk. It's the only thing he knows how to do. He can't <laughs> not do it. Mm. Um, and and I, I can see that. Um, and I know that, um, I'm not one of those who writes too much for pleasure. I write much more for work. Like it's not something that I do just out of enjoyment. I do it when I have a deadline. I do it when I have a story um, on board. Uh, but even then, I, I feel I'm lucky that way. I'm lucky that my job allows me to use this one rare skill that I have. Um, and honestly, I don't know what else I would do. So I think it's just sort of like intrinsic to um, what I am and what I can do. <laughs> You've talked about writing being that uh, bedrock for uh, that helps you expand your skill set, expand professionally, right? So let's talk about your writing process. Um, do you like to go with the flow? Do you like to outline and plan? Because um, I am a chronic planner, you know, like I would spend uh, two weeks planning and then maybe oh, wow. half a day writing. So uh, tell me a little bit about your process and what that's like. Sure. So um, I think you sent me your pointers like last week and this week I was writing an article and I was like, okay, let me try and understand my own process uh, because it's not something I've tried to articulate. Um, mm. One thing which I have, I know used in class as well, um, is that if you know your start, if you know your opening paragraph, it becomes much easier. Um, and I think like when I'm interviewing someone, when I'm doing a story, I'm all the time thinking in my head, uh, how do I lead into the story, right? Because I think once I have that in, the rest kind of flows quite organically. Um, and I know as a writer, I struggle the most about the opening paragraph. It is just something which I probably read the opening paragraph 20 to 30 times. The rest of the piece I might have read 
10 times, right? Um, I think that's this huge difference. Um, and often it then happens that your opening paragraph sounds belabored because you've like just gone to it mm. many, so many times. I think that's also a risk. And I know even I'm. it's happened to me. Um, but I think for me, once I, um, I think someone used this line, which I find very relevant, is use procrastination as rehearsal. Um, and again, as a journalist, I don't really write unless I have a deadline, but I feel even if I'm not writing in my head, I am rehearsing what my story might be, right? I have a vague idea of what's my opening. I have a vague idea of what is my second and third paragraph, not beyond that, right? Mm -hmm. um, because then I definitely go into the flow. Um, so yeah, I think my, the process is very sort of just sit down at the computer with a deadline above you <laughs> and start writing. Um, but it's also while you are researching the story, you are thinking of the writing process. So in my head, they're not two separate. Um, they, they're not two separate processes. Um, while I am in the story, I'm thinking about okay, how do I describe this? How do I put this down on paper? And I think that's what I like about journalism, right? Like the the writing kind of is so organic to the entire uh, process itself. I use process mm. a lot. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, so, so it's it's sort of it's sort of fluid. You don't uh, right. have um, a rigid structure or an or a process in place that you follow every time um and let's let's talk about the opening paragraph a little bit more and um also coming back to your uh classes on writing <laughs> right so you you spend a lot of time explaining how to write a paragraph right and um and I, I'll, I'll connect these two things later but uh, tell me a little bit about uh when you know when do when does a writer know that they have a good opening <laughs> i think you have a good opening when you know how the rest of the piece is going to flow um and i think that's important like um so the kind of openings that i often like are narrative styles right um a narrative opening in the sense of it's if you're profiling someone it's that one particular incident that kind of tells us something about the person, for example, right? Um, or if you're reviewing a book, it's kind of when you're able to draw connections with other books or other works, and you're kind of like, this will help the reader understand. Um, but to me, an opening paragraph, you know as a writer that it's working or it's good if you know what the rest of the piece is going to be, at least in your head, right? You can see the, the bullet points. It's not like you know every sentence, obviously, but you can see the bullet points. Um, I know uh, in, as a like having taught elements of writing for like nearly 10 years now, um, I do see scholars struggling with the idea of a paragraph. Mm. Um, and I also realize that as a, a, whatever, an instructor, it is kind of tough to explain as well, right? Because you can sort of be uh, very generic and say it's one unit of thought. Mm. Uh, but that's not particularly helpful. Yeah, uh, what is that? <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> mm. uh, or it's like one particular subject right. but even that so I, again i find um and then when you read like a lot of writing you can mm. tell who has understood the concept of a paragraph and who hasn't right yeah yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and again so as a writer that's something even i struggle with i'm like um do i have enough material for one paragraph right so to me one paragraph is a single idea and at least like seven eight sentences around that right um and i like short paragraphs i like short sentences that's just my personal style um, but I need, um, in my head, I need to know I have enough material for this one paragraph, right? And again, it's not, um, I have sort of bullet points for each paragraph, but again, it's kind of going with, it happens while I'm writing. A lot of it happens while I'm writing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, it was funny because I think, again, one of the things you asked about uh, in your pointers, in your sort of talking points, was what do you like the most about writing? Um, and for me, the fun part is editing my own work. Mm. Um, and in fact, like again, since I was writing recently, was, I find the first draft really difficult. Yes. The first draft I am struggling through. I'm just like, oh, I have <laughs> nothing to say. Oh, I have too much to say and I don't know how to put it down. Yeah. Uh, but once it's put it down, that's when I really have fun. I'm like, mm. okay, this sentence I can like, I can use an alliteration. This sentence I can use a metaphor. Mm. Um, so for me, like... I think that's when the writing process really like I find most exciting was the first process of just putting it down on a blank sheet, 
is painful. Like how many right. other times you do it right. um, when you have a blank sheet in front of you, when you have to write something, mm. it's just all in your head and it's all so jumbled up. Um, and the putting down is, at least I don't find it easy, but I enjoy <laughs> the process of like editing my own work. I'm just mm. like, okay, this is where I can sort of like, uh, have fun with it and enjoy it and tailor it and kind of you know make it okay, try and make it sparkle it might not <laughs> it yeah. might be a complete <laughs> thing but at least I can attempt it um, yeah. mm -hmm. all right so a lot a lot to discuss Sorry. there <laughs> um, so the first thing is um, that you said is that a lot of people uh, grapple with the idea of what an idea is or what a fully formed thought would look like on paper, right? Um, which ideally would form a paragraph here. Right. right. Um, and I, I faced a similar challenge when I'm trying to explain to students, you know, uh, you need to write clearly, you need to explain things better. Then in order to do that, you need to break down what you're trying to say. And um, somehow as I'm explaining it, you know, I would say that I'm not fully convinced that ideas are broken down in that. In some ways, you know, ideas are all interconnected and they're also abstract. And it would right. be presumptuous to say that there's a clear-cut boundary between A and B. Mm -hmm. Right. So um yeah, how how does how would how would a you know aspiring writer or someone who's just thinking about um you know writing a book and essay right. uh, grapple with those those thoughts and it's these thoughts are very closely connected with right. procrastination and imposter <laughs> imposter syndrome right because uh, procrastination is basically your mind and body trying to tell you you're not ready or to face the challenge right. right when we are ready we we sit down and then the thoughts just seem to flow sometimes but uh, often we'll find ourselves, oh, I need to clean my room, I need to you know, fold my clothes, I need to cook right. food, I need to do this, that. All of all the other things sort of come to the fore. Um, so yeah, how, how does one deal with these uh, emotions, with these uh, you know, imbalances? Right. Um, so I think firstly, everyone's a victim of it. I mean, maybe at least I am. I don't know, maybe the world's most famous authors are not. <laughs> Um, but I think and there was also a meme which I found rather funny and it was a cartoon of this really sparkling house um, and the caption just said that you know if you want a clean house get a writer on a deadline um, and, and, and it's so true right because even I yeah. know I'm telling me like oh I have to wash every dish in the sink before yeah. I sit down right yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that sort of reassures me that we are all mm. sort of in the same boat, um, mm. unless you're maybe like a royal mm. doll who like sat in his room for eight hours a day and did nothing else. <laughs> um, but um, I don't think most of us are like that, right? Um, mm. I do think that, um, you know, the like you said, it, it is a bit of a, a challenge to sit down and write because you have all these other voices in your head, right? Mm. Um, mm. And again, I, I've been, I have been writing for so long, but that doesn't... Um, and I have a certain muscle. I know how long it's going to take me to write a 2000 word piece. Um, again, because I've just done this for so long. Um, I know how to set that time aside. I know how much time it's going to take me to edit. But this is just all practice, 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 right? It's nothing else. Um, but even then, um, so in fact, sort of just as an aside, um, today, the Nobel Prize of Literature is going to be announced, right? Um, it's announced it's always happens on a Thursday. It always happens 4 p.m. India time. Um, and the deadline for our pages to go to press is around 10 p.m. Um, so I'm on standby because I know I'm going to have to write this piece in a couple of hours. Um, and it often happens that I might not have even heard of the author, right? Mm. <laughs> um, so then you're kind of thrown into this vortex where yeah. you as the literary editor are supposed to have this grand position <laughs> about the Nobel laureate and you might not know who he or she is, right? Um, but again, I've done this now like four or five years, right? Um, and uh, so in fact, my husband was asking me, he's like, oh, how, you, how do you do it? So I was like, well, the first thing I'll do is like go download two, three books on my yeah. Kindle by that yeah. author and then do like this frenetic speed read in like three <laughs> hours um, and try and, mm. and then of course, you uh, you know, it depends on who it is um, and you kind of read around him or her and you get a few ideas. But I mean, it's a short piece. It's, it's about mm. like, 
600 words. It's not, it's not a massive piece. Uh, but even then, it's just that um, you take, a, I, I also, in my writing, I feel it's really important to do the research, uh, to mm. do the reading around it. Um, and so it's not enough to just kind of read a Wikipedia entry about that person, right? Then you, you don't have enough information there. Yeah. You have to have, at least in those five hours, you have to try and engage with that person's work, right? So of yeah. course, it's not going to be a brilliant analysis, you know, one that's not expected, but you're writing a news piece, you have to write it to deadline. Um, so you use the tools at hand and like, you know, thankfully with Kindle, et cetera, you can get a book immediately. Um, it's not the perfect process, obviously. Sometimes, of course, when the author is not even translated into English, you're like, oh, okay, you can't do yeah. anything. <laughs> That's <laughs> so, the best one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Then you're just like, well, I can't write. <laughs> yeah. Um, Hmm. But uh, so the last few years, I think last hmm. year she was a French author, Annie Ernu, but her work has been widely translated. Before that was Abdul Gurna. Again, he wrote in English, so work is you know fairly easily available. Um, so yeah, again, I think that a lot of the imposter syndrome can, hmm. can be dispelled um, in crisis. <laughs> so when you're in this moment of crisis that you have to write, uh, that's all you can do. You can't make any more excuses. You can't sort of clean your room right like um i can clean yeah. my room now but <laughs> after 4 p.m i cannot right like i know that today um, um so i think it's just um but at some point like since this is a podcast for writers i feel everyone is here sort of voluntarily um mm. and those who are here do enjoy this process right um i think again i think it was kiran desai who's like who said it's the hardest thing i love to do right um mm. and i think mm. that's what it is true. It, it's not, none of us or no writer finds it easy, uh, but you still enjoy it. You still are kind of like, uh, this is what gets me. This is what excites me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and sorry, as for the paragraph thing, I've been struggling to teach this for like 10 years. <laughs> I don't think I have an answer. Um, except for maybe pointing out to people in their writing where there's too much happening in a paragraph or where there's too little. Uh, but yeah, honestly, I don't, I don't have a, sort of a copy paste answer for it because like you said totally that you know all this is so interconnected so where do you break it where do you start again um you know i i don't think that these are sort of things that are easy there are easy fixes to it i mean maybe chat gpt has a better answer <laughs> maybe <laughs> it has gone through far more but it definitely has gone through far more paragraphs than you and i have but mm, uh, mm, mm, mm. yeah i do find the the para process a bit uh obscure to explain <laughs> mm -hmm. so do do you think writing is uh, quote unquote teachable yeah so it's interesting because i think i've been asked this question and i have asked this question myself um so i've done two journalism programs um like in uh, what in new york and in india and i found them hugely useful um mm. and just for the very simple reason that when you are in a newsroom, you get very little feedback on your writing. It is right. only in the classroom where you get some sort of feedback from your professor, from your cohort, et cetera. Um, and for me, that was sort of the big, the most important thing. Um, again, like when I was in university, I've like gotten my papers back fully read and yeah. I've actually like cried about it, but I've also just learned so much, right? So mm -hmm. in a newsroom, people just don't have that kind of time. They don't have that kind of um, engagement in making you your best. Um, but whereas I think in a classroom, that's there. Um, yeah. So I think just for in terms of feedback, um, I have learned a lot from like going from studying writing, from studying journalism. Um, mm. And again, like people, you know, so many people have written amazing books without ever having gone to a writing program, which is wonderful. Um, hats off to them but um, I feel I have learned from it and I, that's why I think I also like to teach it because I do think it's a skill um, and I do think it's a skill that can be taught right at least you can um, get pointers right um, it can sort of demystify it a little bit because for a lot of people writing is this uh, you know this monster that they don't understand but hopefully like in the classroom it can just sort of become um, a little less intimidating. I think that's what a classroom. Yeah, yeah. and 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 if I'm if I'm getting this right, what you're saying is we learn most about writing when we are workshopping our work, right. right? When when we're getting feedback from others and from your peers, from your teacher or whoever instructor. 
Hmm. Exactly. So I think, uh, you know, maybe there are some newsrooms that are much more collaborative and people are sort of, look. so I mean, everything I write is read by two other people. And I'm really grateful for that because I do know I'm making this like, and I do know a, a third pair of eyes is going to catch those, which I'm really hmm. like, that's what I like about journalism as well, right? Like, I like that there are gatekeepers. Uh, but the level of engagement is just so different, right? Like in a classroom, mm. there's just so much more uh, time and warmth, hopefully. Um, and uh, again, like I feel I've learned so much from my cohort, right? Um, again, And also you, I think you listen carefully when your own peers are reading your work as well. At least that's what I feel. Um, so I still remember like one of my friends, she was uh, from New Zealand, an excellent writer. And she was looking at my work and she was like, you have so many there is and there are. I'm sure you can have a better alternative to that and Ooh. it's true I, yeah I, I never thought about that because there yeah. isn't there are it's just such a common mm. thing and I was like yeah you're right I think I can find a better alternative so you know mm. I mean this she told me whatever 15 years ago and it's it's kind of stuck in my head um and I think that's what I like about um studying journalism or studying writing right that mm. uh you know you are with this fellowship that's struggling or flourishing as much as you are and you all sort of in it together um, mm. And otherwise, because writing is a lonely process, right? It is a solitary endeavor. Um, yeah, yeah. Speaking of which, um, <laughs> you talked about editing being that enjoyable part of the process, right? right. Um, can you tell us, give us an insight into your editing process? Do you have, uh, you know, you know, of course, you have your house style, and then you're looking for errors in the piece. You're looking at structure. Um, how how do you go about this process and why is it more enjoyable than writing itself? Right. Uh, so I think again, like since you and I have both been in classrooms, yeah, I think we have faced this question where scholars are like, what is editing? Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because many of them have not even um, thought of that. Um, mm. And in my head, writing is rewriting, right? I'm, mm. I'm so clear about that. Um, if my first version was a version that would go into print, I'd be very worried, right? Like, mm. It's not going to make much sense to most people. It probably wouldn't even make sense to me. Um, my first version is literally, uh, you know, like, I don't want to say this, but it's like barfing on the page, right? It's, right. Just, yeah. it's just all in my head and I'm putting it out there, but yeah. I do not want anyone to see that version, right? Um, it's only afterwards that then I can sort of go back and I say that, okay, this is all my material. Now, how do I make sense of it, right? Um, and I think, so editing is essentially rewriting. So the first process is, of course, okay, I have all my information down. Um, now, how do I sort of structure it better? Um, and then, of course, I'm looking, you know, at th that's when maybe I'm looking at paragraphs. That's when I'm sort of uh, looking at um, whether this is cohesive, whether it's making sense. Um, and then the final process is going sentence by sentence. And, you know, the things that uh, am I repeating the same word um, again, like yesterday I'd written something and I wrote, saw creation was appearing twice in the same paragraph. And I noticed this only at like one in the morning and I called my colleagues saying, oh, can you remove that creation? Because I'm like, creation yeah. is a big word, right? And you don't yeah. want to have that big word appearing twice. Um, and then she came back to me and said, oh, you have asserts also twice in one paragraph. And I was like, yeah, please take out one. <laughs> um, and she's like, should I put po posits? And I'm like, no, I never use words like posits. <laughs> Like, I don't even know how to pronounce it. I know it's P-O-S-I-T, but like, that's that's not a word I use. So I was like, no, just make it claims or says, right? Mm, so again, mm. you're kind of looking at each word and you're kind of also being, uh, you're kind of like, what is the word that I use, right? Like, I don't want to use a word that's not true to me. That's not true to my kind of language. Um, and I think, yes, yeah, so if, I think every writer or especially like the new writers have to sort of realize that writing is rewriting. You know, you, you cannot um, sort of expect your first draft to be um, publishable, right? Mm, you cannot, mm. you, and like even an email, um, I, I'm whatever, I write 50 emails a day, but I you do have to read it a second time, right? Because we all are going to make mistakes, right? It's not yeah. like we're not going to make mistakes. Yeah. Uh, but you just need that second read to make sure that you haven't made a, a howler, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, and I think that's what editing is. Um, and again, like this is, a, I think George Saunders who said, you know, for him, writing is just to be less of a dud on the page. Um, and I think that's just my motto, right? I think when I'm speaking, I'm kind of like going here and there. I'm, I have uh, sort of repeating myself, but at least when I write and what I finally publish, it's just me being less of a dud, right? It's just uh, that simple. Um, 
and sorry maybe this is an aside but um so when i interview people i then get a transcription right um and when you get the transcription you realize how even the most articulate authors repeat themselves so much and there's mm. so many fillers and there's so much i know and uh huh and this and that and even it's not even perfectly grammatical when they speak we don't realize when we're listening but when you see it typed down you're just like wow and this um and i kind of it makes me wonder about how um the, the final way that we think we speak especially on paper is so different from actually how we speak um organically and and i realize this only through the transcription process because um when i get the transcription of an interview it's like of like let's say 40 minute interview it's about 10000 words um and then once i edit it of you know getting rid of all the superficialities it's about 5000 words so mm. it's really like 10000 words that have just sort of you know we use as fillers in speech which in writing we be like what is this rubbish right yeah like, yeah <laughs> how can you <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, yeah. hmm so you you've talked about the enjoyable part tell me a little <laughs> bit about <laughs> the challenging bit which is the first draft how do you approach a first draft um yeah so the first draft again like i think um i can tell you a first draft a first draft that i enjoyed um hmm. and this again happened 3 years ago it was during the lockdown um and it was the, the the really severe phase when no one could go out etc um and my colleague a photographer and i we had our press passes or whatever um and we were like let's go and we didn't tell office or anything and it was i think must have been march right so when delhi was beautiful the, it was sort of that slanting sunshine and we were going around the city and the city was unreal right it was just desolate and there was no one yeah. and nothing except for like police uh, checkpoints um and then of course till we hit noida and then we saw the migrants right and then there was a sort of sea of humanity mm. um and both of us were just kind of like we had not seen mm. anything like that right uh, we sort of are in latians delhi and it's both of us were like oh this is amazing it's yeah. so beautiful and of course there's no one else on the road and it's all the beautiful sandstone and then you like go across the river and it's just desperation right um yeah. and i remember yeah. going back home that day and like putting down my first draft in like maybe a couple of hours and that's never happened before but it was just something that was so um unusual and so compelling right mm, um and mm. i had uh, the entire scene had played out so vividly um that i felt like as a writer my job was very simple i i just had to sort of chronicle what i'd seen what i'd experienced um and also as a journalist i ha- had the privilege of being out when most people did not right um so i kind of had that vantage point um and i still remember just enjoying i mean like i shouldn't say enjoying but that's the only first draft i have like found easy because mm. it was like literally just describing a movie that you have seen and describing a movie that no one else has seen right yeah, uh, so you're yeah. kind of like okay how do i tell people about this um and i remember that being sort of the writing just came very easily and the writing was something that was quite um effortless charged, charged mm. i think that's the word mm. um but i think after that it's um it's not <laughs> um it's also like um like okay for example like i interview authors right um and now if i'm supposed to write a profile of an author i'm, I'm just trying to think in examples Um so the person I interviewed um maybe a couple of weeks back was Madhav Gadgil right um he's this ecologist he lives in Pune um he wrote the western ghat Com- 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 commission report right he did this huge study about it fascinating person he's like in his late 80s etc um for me it was really uh, exciting to actually meet an author in person after a long time because most of my interviews now are just zoom right um so here I actually went to his house and his house is you know sometimes you just go to an old person's house in the you realize the house is old <laughs> like mm. you know things are not well maintained things and it's just like you know it's like time has got the better of them right like you, mm. you get that mm. sense uh, but he was really generous and he was you know really warm and welcoming etc um but to me the challenge was like okay how do i tell the world about this man who's done so much right um and then then i was like okay since i have the advantage of knowing his location and the name of his book um, i have it here it's called a walk up the hill um i was like okay i will start by describing the hills around him 
um, because I've now seen those hills. I know those hills. Um, and it also so happens that he lives quite close to my house, right? Um, so I, I have that sort of first person thing. Um, so for me, that was the in into the story, right? Uh, because initially I was kind of like, um, the book is a biography, it's, a, it's an autobiography, etc. And it's a lot about his work. There's not much about the personal, but I'm like, how do I humanize this story? And for me, the way to humanize the story was, okay, the name of the book is Walk Up the Hill. I've seen the hills around him. This is my entry point into the story, right? Um, so I think, so the challenge is always like, um, how do I... Um, um, how do I sort of reconfigure a story uh, without knowing the ending? Right? Mm. Um, and again, so because when I'm writing, I very seldom know my last paragraph, but yeah. I do know like what I want to tell readers about this person, right? So for Gadgil, it was his love for nature. Uh, in fact, the next piece that I've just done is about Shashi Tharoor. Uh, that entire piece is about his love for language, right? Uh, so that's kind of the thread that's going to be running through the story, right? So for Gadgil, um, it's about nature. It's about how he's always out there. He's meeting people. He has, you know, traveled and he's traveled the country like on foot, right? He's not gone by like car or anything. And he's done this mm. for like the last 50 years. Um, for someone like Tarur, it's like he's been writing since the age of 13. He might have like, you know, very high pressure jobs, but the thing that roots him is always mm. going to be language, mm. right? So mm -hmm. I think um, that like once I find that thread about what is it I'm trying to tell readers about this person, then the first draft kind of comes into place, right? Uh, but uh, right. the, the right. first challenge is to find that thread. Like I need to know uh, what is it that's going to tie, what is the spine of the story? What is the yeah. central yeah. line? Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Do you do you also end up, did you also end up writing about his living environment or did that not feature? <laughs> Yeah, no, I just sort of put it in passing about like he's hmm. surrounded by artifacts that predate him. All that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's but, a nice way to exactly. say that. I mean, yeah, I, I, yeah. So I didn't want to say the house is very dusty. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. So, yeah. so you know, um, very beautifully, you're also you've also sort of touched upon the next point, which is incorporating lived experiences into your writing, right? And you've talked about how um, uh, nature stimulated you, how uh, human large human gatherings have <laughs> affected you uh, into writing writing a piece in like two hours, right? Uh, and and you know that happens to most writers every now and then that that uh, you're inspired to write. But my question is more about how um, you've evolved over time as a writer because um, now you do a lot. Like we talked about, you're you're interviewing writers. You know, you're you're visiting these environments that gave uh, give these writers inspiration, shape their work. Uh, you have the privilege of speaking to them, understanding their story. And you also have the privilege of walking into a classroom and talking to these dullards <laughs> <laughs> who are struggling with their writing, right? So um, my question is, how have these experiences shaped you, shaped your work? Um, so yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think firstly, I mean, you and I being in classrooms, we cannot call them dullards. <laughs> I'm going to cut that out. <laughs> you have to cut that out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we call them scholars. We don't even call them students. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but Corrections. I that, uh, yeah. We walk into the classrooms and uh, speak to scholars who are trying to learn how to write. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Um, no, so I, um, I think I'm just going to sort of answer this in two ways. Um, as a journalist, on one hand, I feel, um, of course, all writing is subjective, right? There is no writing that is uh, objective. Um, mm. You know, as soon as I write, I'm writing with my entire baggage. I'm writing with my entire experience. Um, but I also find that nowadays, especially maybe because of social media, maybe because there's so much of putting yourself forward, there's too much of the I in the story. And I mean, in journalism, right? Um, and I also feel that maybe scholars, you know, younger writers have that tendency as well to always foreground themselves. Um, and I'm just like, 
you you have to ask yourself what is the story right um mm. so for example if someone is reporting on a fire or you know i'm just giving a, a a banal example if your first part of the story is how you reached the fire about how you had to go through so many obstacles uh that's totally redundant right like yeah. no one cares yeah. how you got there um, but mm. i find there's a lot of writing which is like that it's about how I had to take a boat. I had to take a bus. I went. I mean, whatever. The in, that's introduction is a chronological account exactly. of everything that has happened exactly. before the event. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Um. So I think that you know you do definitely depending on what it is, and especially if it's a reported story, uh, you are very insignificant as a writer, as a reporter, right? Um. You, the only way that you should feature in the story is not in the first person, but in terms of what you put on the page. Um. Hmm. And again, like I have of course written a few personal essays, etc. But um. It, it is a completely different discipline, right? Um, it's a completely sort of different way of thinking. Um, again, maybe because I am trained as a journalist, I find the first person writing, I have to sort of totally be, I have to step back. And because the first thought in my head is like, oh, my boss is going to read this, right? <laughs> because I'm so like, you know, just tuned into thinking about like writing for a professional place um, mm. that I find the personal a little more challenging. I mean, I, I mean, I do enjoy it as well, but it's it's just, it's a different sort of um, toolkit, um, I feel, right? Uh, toolkit is now a dangerous word, but it's a different set of tools. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, and then uh, in terms of how these various experiences have shaped me, I don't know if I have an answer to that. I just feel that, like you said, I think I am very privileged. I am very lucky so in, uh, to be able to say that my job is reading right mm. my job mm. is talking to authors um and yeah. I'm, I'm and i'm very aware of that like i think a lot mm. of people um so in fact like so uh, my magazine goes to press on when it's day night expect like my pages and that's why thursdays is a bit lax and often i'll go for a movie on thursday and my husband's like what sort of job do you have and i'm like i'm the cultural critic i need to know about like <laughs> culture exactly this is part of my workplace memo. Like I cannot mm. not know about Jawan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, mm. so I am, mm. I am very aware that my job has has many perks. Or uh, you know, mm. I'm mm. I'm getting to do. Um, and a lot of people are like, oh, you to read so much, and it's true. I, I read a fair amount, but again, I'm very fortunate that my job's requirement is that I read, right? Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Like, um, and also it's. I'm not just reading the book that I'm interviewing the author about. I'm also reading around it, et cetera, right? Um, and again, it's just, I, I am very aware that I am sort of uh, mm, lucky mm, and fortunate mm. to, be able, to be in a space where um, this is my bread and butter as well. This is not, this is not, uh, I'm not doing this only for enjoyment, right? And then it's lucky yeah. that I do enjoy it as well. Yeah. So, it's, so, um, if I could labor the point a little bit more, <laughs> when you, uh, let's say, review your work from uh, five years ago or maybe, you know, eight, 10 years ago, do you, do you find a change in tone, voice, or maybe pace, any of those things? Um, so, yeah, it's interesting because, you know, if you ask me about a book I read 10 years ago, hmm. the chances are I'm not going to remember anything. Hmm. I won't even remember, like, the bare plot line. Um, and then I kind of go back and I read what I've written. And then I'm like, oh, now I remember the book, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I feel that once I have written about it, it is just sort of like left my system. <laughs> like yeah. it is not in my system any longer. Um, and then I think again, I, I I'm not, I'm not uh, what should I say, sentimental about my writing. Um, I also think that's because as a journalist, I know that people use newspapers to like wrap their shoes, right? Like I, I'm very, you know, I have no pretenses about this. I have no, yeah, um, yeah. And, and again, um, as a journalist, I'm not attached to my magazine. Like I don't keep copies right. of it. Um, I right. don't like sort of be like, oh, I need to keep a print copy. I think my parents have many more than I do. Yeah. Um, and I also know that, you know, um, it's, it is not forever, right? Hmm. There's a, there's a short life, right? And because, as, again, I'm talking as a journalist, I'm not talking about as a novelist or any of that. Um, so I think I, that way I have a certain distance from my own work. Um, and I, I can be, um, I, in a way, I'm kind of, um, 
you know, I wouldn't say even ruthless because I just, it's, it's very rarely when I'm like, oh, I wrote so well. Oh, I need to find this article. <laughs> um, mm. And once, and sometimes when I go back, um, I'm pleasantly surprised. I'm like, oh, okay, this was pretty well written. Um, and of course, sometimes I'm just like, oh my God, like, what was I thinking? <laughs> um, so I think it's a bit of both. Um, but, you know, it's, we were talking about if you can learn writing, uh, maybe I'm sort of, you know, I shouldn't say this aloud. But when I came back from the US and I just sort of joined the Express, um, and the Indian Express also has a very rigorous newsroom, right? Like they really sort of edit very carefully, et cetera. And I think I just come back from this sort of very intensive writing program. I think my writing then was very good. And this was, you know, 15 years ago, so I shouldn't say that. Mm. Um, but mm. when I look at those pieces, I feel there's a certain sort of, um, it's not lazy. Um, and I know like, Sometimes when I look at my own writing, I know when I've been lazy. I know when I have just sort of followed a template, uh, when I've kind of not even tried to push myself. Like, again, when you've been doing it for so long, you know when you've put in enough effort, when you put in minimal effort, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And, and I think, again, you all of us should need to have that self-awareness. Uh, you know, mm. it's, it's not as of everything I write is brilliant. Um, sometimes I'll be like, okay, I know I've written this well and I'll send it to a few friends. So then even my friends are like, oh, okay, you, you're pleased with this. And I'm like, yes, mm. I'm pleased with it. But again, like mm. In, mm. I write maybe every week, every fortnight and that pleasure mm. or that feeling of achieve, accomplishment will come maybe once in a couple of months, right? It's, mm. it, um, it's, not, a, it's not a frequent occurrence, right? Um, yeah, yeah. It's a tough no. life. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think but, it's also just hmm. being aware that very few people read. Like, hmm. whatever I write, I'm just kind of like, I'm writing into a void. Like, okay, yeah. the, the author I have written about, okay, he might be interested, his mother might hmm. be interested. <laughs> Maybe the publisher is interested, but yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. Okay, and my parents are interested, so yeah, five readers. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's a there's a funny story I have to share. Uh, so my first uh, job was uh, as an editor for a magazine in Bangalore, and uh, you know, two years into the job, uh, they promoted me to the managing editor's role. And uh, one of these days, I go down, and there's this new Jhalmuri guy. Sit, standing there and selling Janmuri and uh, I noticed that he was using pages from our magazine <laughs> right outside our office and uh, so I go and talk to our guy um, the admin of whoever was managing the office and I told him this is happening and uh, basically the solution that he had was to uh, give I'm not going to name the newspaper, but the newspaper that we would subscribe to. So basically now he had a free uh, <laughs> packaging solution for this oh. Janamari guy. So yeah, it, very few people read. And um, also, uh, I mean, we know that, you know, the written word is sort of um, lagging way behind um, other mediums of right. uh, reporting, entertainment, uh, general content con consumption. You know, the world is moving towards uh, AV, audiovisual, and right. shorts. Oh my God, the the in shorts news in apps, shorts. news yeah. apps, etc. Right. Um, and and I don't know if that's a criticism of writing itself, mm -hmm. but rather maybe a direction that you know things that you just don't have control over. Right. Right. So. Uh, so as writers, we are also forced to change with the times. Right. Like you said, you know, the the opening is perhaps more important now than it was ten years ago, because you know maybe fifty percent or about seventy percent of our readers will just read the first few paragraphs exactly. of the article, right? Yeah. And and the rest is just just there. Yeah, just there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and which which also. Uh, brings me in, uh, to the next point, which is um, we talked about, you know, criticisms we receive as writers and how we deal with them. And uh, if you can share a criticism that you've received. <laughs> and uh, it's it's a tough, a tough uh, experience to receive criticism because, you know, very few people know how to provide good feedback. You talked right. about workshopping, writing, and how the, the space is extremely important right mm -hmm. the environment is extremely important in which you receive feedback otherwise right. 
feedback then just turns into criticism, which is the ne negative uh, connotation of feedback, right? Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, so thanks, Adip. I think those are sort of two big questions. Um, and I think I think the fact that um, people are not reading is something that writers can't sort of get on their high horse about. Um, I think they need to sort of figure out a way that people are going to read, right? Um, and I think that's the challenge. Um, I don't think people have found a way. I mean, there are sort of authors like Sally Rooney, etc., the young smart ones who use a lot of sort of texting in their um, books and that sort of instead of dialogue they use text messages right and I think that's that's sort of smart that's intelligent um, and that's also true to our times right mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. many of us uh, at least like I know since I'm working remotely um, all of my professional communication is WhatsApp, right? Um, right. It, I'm not picking up the phone and calling colleagues. It's just WhatsApp, WhatsApp, WhatsApp. Um, yeah. So I find my entire sort of office uh, space is that, right? Yeah, and I think yeah. even personally now that's changing. So and I think mm. novels haven't started reflecting that, right? Um, mm. And mm. again, this is just something that, you know, I might be wrong. It's just something I feel sort of personally, I'm kind of like, we need books today or we need sort of fiction today to be more reflective of what readers and we how we communicate right um i think right now there's a disjunct um there's a disjunct in how uh, writers are writing on the page and how as a society we're communicating um and i find like a novel that i want to sort of read or a novel that i have in my head or whatever uh, is kind of going to try and fill that gap Right. Um, and mm, like you mm. said, right, um, the fact that people are not reading is a criticism of writing. Right. Um, and I think we sort of have to acknowledge that. Um, uh, again, I think, you know, as a journalist, I like long form. I like, you know, writing 2000 words. But again, I am very aware, of, like most people are not going to read that. Most people are not going to read 2000 words. Right. And so then like what you're doing, then you sort of think of other ways to get people to engage. So whether it's mm. a podcast, whether it's an in shot, whether it's a read, mm. but also yeah. or you find more innovative ways of, to write, I think, right? Yeah. I think we need yeah. to sort of acknowledge that. Um, the other thing you mentioned about criticism. Um, so I think you need to have readers you trust um, in the sense of, uh, so my father, I think, is one of like my closest readers. He reads everything I read. Um, so I know, he, like, he pointed out how once I had written the foreword of a book, the F O R E W O R D, as the male foreword, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, and he was just like, "How could you do that?" And then even I was like, "Oh my god, how could I do that?" Right? Yeah. And, you know, and, and this is after it's gone into print, so it's much too late to correct it. Uh, but these are the things that stick in one's head then I know for example I was once talking about towing the line um, you know I'd use that phrase in some some writing of mine and I wrote T-O-E right because I was like <laughs> tow the line yeah. right? <laughs> and again my editor was like what is this <laughs> what's happening <laughs> what's happening yeah. So, yeah, okay I guess I'm revealing that I have bad spellings but it's also <laughs> just um, you know you need readers like Again, maybe nine out of 10 readers would have read my piece, not caught forward and forward. Mm. Uh, but you need that 10th reader who's just going to sort of be like, no, this is wrong. You got it mm. wrong. Mm. Um, I mean, these are just sort of the smaller things. But again, like a friend of mine, he writes a lot. He writes on classical music, et cetera. And that's, I think I mentioned to you before, but I wrote a piece about a woman katam player. It's, you know, that pot-like instrument. Um, it's a, a, a fairly like solid instrument that not many women who play it. And she was a sort of this elderly woman and she is one of the few pioneers of it. Um, and I'd spoken to her and I did this piece, et cetera. And I was quite proud of it. Um, and since he writes about music, I sent it to him saying, oh, look at me writing about like whatever, Hindustani classical music. And I'd written something about, of course, I was trying to describe the sound of the ghatam. Um, and I said, oh, you know, it sounds like the ghatam sounds like rain falling on a tin roof or something like that. And he thought it was atrocious, right? So even now, like when we meet, he's like, oh, the rain falling in the tin roof. <laughs> Um, so I think mm. it helps mm. to have friends or readers who, of course, I know he's saying this because he this is his music scene. This mm. is he mm. writes mm. about this. He's knowledgeable, um, mm. and he knows I don't write about it. Um, so I'm trying to you know be poetic. I'm trying to sort of make it relatable, um, but I'm also probably failing, right? Mm. Um, mm. So I think you definitely and 
you know, it's a good point how uh, feedback can become criticism, and that's very true. Um, but I think you need to hear it. I think we need to hear the criticism, right? Um, mm. I think if people are bothering to read your work, just be grateful. <laughs> and then right. they tell you it's shit. <laughs> think that it you it, at least be like okay in their eyes it's shit right like maybe mm. in my eyes it's not mm. uh, but I think you have to sort of acknowledge that um yeah maybe this person doesn't like it it's okay you know mm. it's totally all right for someone to not like it um because it is again it is very subjective right like um a million people might write how Chetan Bhagat right I mean, I mean a million people might like how Chetan Bhagat writes uh but you know thousand people might be like oh I prefer with them gosh it's fine right everyone can have that taste everyone can have their choices um and you as a writer I think need to sort of be cognizant or aware of it right um I and I, mm -hmm. I think um you know again I said peers are important and hopefully one doesn't have peers who are just sort of trying to pull you down so as long as you don't have that and I think you know mm. take, the, take the criticism on board <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. I also like how uh, you have a sense of humor <laughs> that helps you deal with it yeah no again I'm just glad if people are reading me <laughs> <laughs> I'm like Are you read the fourth paragraph <laughs> <laughs> that's a win that's yeah, a win yeah it's, it's, exactly it's, right it's, I, I think you need to have that humility mm. about uh, especially mm. I think as a journalist right I think as a novelist it's different because this person has taken the conscious decision to pick up this novel and to read it right um, as a reader um, mm. so maybe then as a writer you kind of like uh, you feel less emboldened I don't know I maybe mm. I'm wrong about this mm -hmm. uh, but I think as a journalist for me like you said it's a win if the person has read from start to finish like that's all I'm expecting um, and then if it's going into the kabadi the next day it's that's how it is. <laughs> so, so what you're saying is journalists are more humble than novelists. Yeah, I think they should be. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think writing on one hand, when you write, you need to not think of your audience at all, um, and you need to just sort of uh, think about how can you put this in the most sort of clear and lucid manner I think that is important right um, I think there are many authors who want their readers to have to work for it uh, but I think if you're an early writer etc um, don't go down that route right like maybe you know if you're a Salman Rushdie it's okay you can make people uh, make mm. readers sort of work for what you're trying um, but I think right now the goal is just to sort of be are readers understanding what you're trying to say, right? I mm, think it's just mm. um, that that's that simple. Um, and I think also, you know, those of us who've chosen to write, um, like I think when you first sent me the question about, oh, you know, why do you want to write? Um, it's also creating something out of nothing, right? Mm. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that. Um, um, they kind of like, oh, you, what have you built? What have you made, right? Um, and you know, the, especially in today's society, which is so about the concrete, which is about the capital, etc. Um, I kind of find that writing is just, it's a void, it's an emptiness, and you have built something, right? Mm. Now, whether the world reads it or three people read it or one person reads it, um, I think is sort of irrelevant. Um, but where there was nothing, there's something, and it's something that, um, it's just it's simple and then it's meaningful and it's not like it's not taking up space in the universe right it's not adding mm. to the clutter right mm -hmm. um it's just it's out there in the world it, it's to be accepted or it's not to be accepted and i think like um for me i think yeah maybe that's also the beauty of writing it is just it's the process of creation um mm. and it's a process of um then whether the world accepts it or not or embraces it or not is a different question <laughs> mm -hmm. that's a beautiful thought <laughs> creating yeah. meaning out of absurdity yeah yeah and just out of nothingness right like mm -hmm. this did not exist um, right. and then it does exist right and i think that's kind of nice yeah yeah that's that's a beautiful thought to uh, conclude <laughs> you can keep going our no, no, question answer session fire. but yeah now now we have the tough part <laughs> exactly <laughs> which is the rapid fire round are you ready for it i'm ready for it okay i'm not going to give you a lot of time to answer the questions so you have to be oh, really quick i can't quick, like quick, give you quick, like a quick, quick. <laughs> yeah <laughs> quick okay um so i have five questions for you 
and uh, we'll try to do it in under five minutes. Okay. okay. That's fine. <laughs> um so the first question is what's your favorite book oh my gosh um can i say favorite author is joan didion um and again it's just something uh, i think i read her at a time when i was trying to find uh sort of journalistic voices that i enjoyed and i think hers is one of them yeah 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 i i love her essay why write right yeah <laughs> um okay what is your if you don't like this you can be my friend book <laughs> no so if you don't like this you can't be my friend you can be my friend oh okay if you don't like it yeah. ah okay okay no so i think i'm i'm less high horsey about these things now <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, i think I, I was much more judgy because again i'm just kind of like we've all gone through mm. phases um, so I like right now, maybe I'd say Ayn Rand or maybe I'd say, <laughs> but again, I know when I was in high school, I read Ayn Rand and now, and also I read it because like some boy I thought was cute, liked it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So how, how these things tend to change huh? <laughs> back then, change. Exactly. back then that was the bestseller and everyone yeah. was reading Ayn Rand, the Fountainhead and right, like, exactly. oh, so and, cool. I, yeah. I have to read this. So that's what, yeah. and no, and I just read it because cute boy read it and I thought, oh, I should like it because <laughs> cute boy liked it. Right? Yeah, yeah. I so, remember uh, the Shantaram was a similar pick. Exactly. Which, oh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So cool. Then, okay. I mean, I'm not a fan of the whole self help genre. So the whole like Paulo Coelho, et cetera. Like, it's mm. just, it doesn't do anything for me. Um, yeah. And I just find it too sort of uh, simplistic. But again, I think I'm, I'm a little. I mean, I'm snobby about my bookshelf, but I think I'm. I try. I hope I'm a little less judgy about other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, so he started. It didn't start off in the self help section, right? He mm. was a fiction writer. Uh, the Alchemist was not self help right. at all. It was a nice story. Uh, I remember I picked up a book thinking that it would be a nice story, and then it turned out to be something else entirely. It was called uh, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it starts off as uh, as a journey of chronicling a journey mm -hmm. of a monk who, whatever, travels to the US. And then suddenly there's the heart of the lotus <laughs> form and, you know, how you're supposed to wake up in the morning and drink some tea. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah that, that's when I realized that this, this genre is just uh, doing something else. Right. But but it's also the coming back to our earlier point. These books tend to sell. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> People are reading these books. No, so again, like again, the publishing industry, etc. It works on people like Jaden Bhagat and Amish Sapati, etc. So again, we as readers and critics can be a bit really snobby about it, uh, hmm. but it's not working on like who wins the book or like at least in India, right? Um, our Indian English fiction is such a small category, and it totally runs on like Ruskin, Bond, and Amish and Jaden, etc. Um, and you know we can be sort of on our literary high horse and be like, oh, that's too massy for us, but who cares right <laughs> yeah, um, yeah so i think there needs to be that kind of awareness and finally like as a leader what more do you want them to be read right so mm -hmm. <laughs> okay rapid fire question number three how would you describe the process of writing agonizing or enjoyable enjoyable agony <laughs> It sounds like some the... bdsm edit that but <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, I was gonna say that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Pleasure in pain. <laughs> yeah, just with edit out the last part. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll put me answering the question. Yeah, that's okay. I love the pain. Okay, <laughs> who, in your opinion, is the most underrated writer? Who underrated? Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I feel everyone is overrated. <laughs> 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 you 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 are not answering these polarizing questions well at all. <laughs> no, I mean like I'm, I'm looking at my bookshelf. I'm looking at my books, and I'm trying to think. Mm -hmm. Um, because I mean, all these people are very like uh, rated. <laughs> mm. Um, 
I think um, an author like Jeet Tayal, uh, I mean, I don't think he is underrated. I mean, he's like sort of been on the Booker shortlist, et cetera. Um, but I think he is someone who's really trying to do something different with each novel. Uh, he's not sort of following his own uh, trope that works, right? Um, so the one that got him on the Booker shortlist was this old druggy tale, et cetera, sitting in, set in Bombay, very like psychedelic. Uh, but with every sort of consecutive book, he's done something new, right? Um, and I kind of, um, like, I think that's amazing. Um, uh, sort of again she's i guess she is very well regarded but an author who i think is quite incredible in what she's doing is jumpa lehri the fact that she's writing in italian i'm just like who does that you have sort of mastered english you have like written these incredible books in english and now you just totally go and change your ball game and you write yeah. in italian and then you translate to that or someone else translates it into english um so i just find like people like her and jeet etc they just they really sort of pushing themselves out of what they know works. Um, mm, and I think mm. that's amazing because otherwise writers just follow their own formula. And if you're not following your own formula, then that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. For a while, she became that tropey writer who just talks about diaspora. Diaspora, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and now she's yeah. so different, yeah. which I find really hard. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check it out. Um, <laughs> okay, last question. If you weren't a writer, what would you be doing? Uh, I can't. <laughs> Nightmare. Oh, what do I do? <laughs> what do I do exactly? <laughs> so it's funny you asked me that, and the image that came to my head was just like being curled up in a ball, <laughs> <laughs> and then cleaning, ferociously cleaning, See, <laughs> organizing cupboards. Exactly. So, what is the creature that curls up into a ball? That's a really cute one. Uh, the, yeah, the porcupine um, yeah exactly something like that yeah, yeah. yeah the pangolin pangolin right yeah yeah so i think i would be like a pangolin cleaning you know <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a pangolin cleaning corridors mm. um i don't know i i mean i don't want to say something predictable like a librarian because that would be really mm. boring but mm. <laughs> um but so, still uh, surrounded by uh writing literature and books yeah i think so um again like i said very few skills very few like <laughs> you know um and you I can be a news news anchor oh no i hate being yeah. on screen no, oh. no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. too, too late for that you're doing you're interviewing writers and oh, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's already <laughs> happening You've been to JLF uh, panels. Bit, yeah, but still, I feel that it's not like news news. You know, mm, the camera is mm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I think as a kid, of course, now I'm just trying to give you an innovative answer. I'm not giving you an honest answer. But mm. I mean, not as a kid, as a teenager, I was like, mm. I want to do an item number. Like that was my sort of like... What? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think I always had that sort of like you know uh, uh, like i don't want to say yeah you know sort of hidden desire so yeah mm -hmm. so maybe maybe i would have found that side of myself but yeah, of course, yeah. I, like i said i'm trying to give you an interesting not authentic answer i, I wouldn't have thought of that <laughs> as your alternate career for sure alternate maybe career. maybe it can be your second career <laughs> so imagine like just being like one of those sheila ki jawani dancers like yeah. i think yeah that would yeah. why not um, I, I recently watched this movie, Rocky or Rani. Have you seen it? I haven't, but like someone described it as puerile. So Shova did call it puerile. <laughs> <laughs> putrid, putrid. That was her word. I, I get it. I get it. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. But yeah, I mean, it was a half decent attempt at educating a middle class family, I guess. Ah, okay. By, by Karan Johar. So I should watch it. Yeah, yeah. You should you should watch it. It's it's a fun watch. It's a fun watch. Right. But yeah, maybe an hour shorter would have been nice. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um yeah. So but but it is on social media. I mean it's on ODT now, right? So maybe I should. Yeah, I think so. I think it's on Prime. Prime, yeah. Amazon Prime. Okay. Yeah. But that's not the interesting uh, recommendation for this episode. <laughs> Please <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the next segment. <laughs> Don't mistake that as uh, as the interesting thing. Like, okay, so um, I ask my guests to sort of bring a recommendation for for the show, uh, for okay. our listeners. Uh, what would be your interesting thing? Oh, inter like a thing or a book? <laughs> it can be a book. It can be an article, a TV show, anything. 
Oh, like that. Um, mm. Okay, again, since I'm sort of looking at books in front of me, um, I'm mm. just going gonna... <laughs> to... Um, so there's this book, it's kind of an, uh, it's a little different. Um, and I usually am not... Um, again, I think when I was in college, et cetera, I used to read a fair amount of poetry. Um, I used to listen to a lot of poetry, et cetera. And now I just don't, and it's a bit of a pity. Uh, but this book I found really quite fascinating because it is the biography of India's first female doctor, uh, who is Anandi Bai Joshi, um, but it's written in verse. Um, so it is this entire story of this woman's life written in poetry. And it's just, um, I found what the poet was doing, poet is Shikha Malve, just um really interesting and innovative and also very accessible right mm. um i think a lot of poetry um is a little difficult to sort of grab grasp um and i think maybe that's why people don't want to engage with it uh but here it's just this woman's story and this woman was amazing she went to the u.s alone she's the first woman who did her medicine um in the u.s and she went at some age 17 or something she's from this um and usually her story is told from the point of view or from the eyes of her husband um her husband who was you know some ridiculous like 20 years older than her or whatever but he did kind of encourage her to study but this book is her story told through her eyes so you also see her sort of trying to you know push back against her husband who must have been fairly like dominating etc um it's about her sort of trying to find her feet in this completely foreign land when she's like still wearing her saris and her bindi and um all of that so yeah i think this book is just um i haven't read anything like this i think it's just incredible to read a biography in verse and also to read a biography uh, where the main person is so it's her at least you feel it's her voice you feel it's her story um, and you feel it's her struggle so yeah I, I really enjoyed this actually wonderful i'll definitely uh, check it out and uh, link it in the show notes <laughs> sure <laughs> uh, and uh, my recommendation is uh, you've definitely read this book uh, the sense of style by steven right, pinker okay. And uh, so Steven Pinker is a psychologist who studies language and its relation to cognition, consciousness, etc. And uh, what I love about this book is how he breaks, literally takes apart sentences and paragraphs and explains uh, meanings and abstractions behind them, what the author was thinking, how a reader perceives it. It's a It's a beautiful exploration of writing and how how one can start thinking about their own voice and style of writing. So yeah, yeah people should I think, definitely yeah, it's check amazing it out. that book because yeah. it also, um, like trying to explain what is good writing and bad writing can be difficult. And he just does it in such a mathematical, hmm. uh, logical fashion. And I think that's what I really loved about the book. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And that, that's also a criticism of this book is that it's... Uh, too prescriptive. Say, yeah, to to which is which is something he he writes in the prologue in the introduction that mm -hmm. uh, you know the other books on style have been too prescriptive <laughs> and uh, you know fallen in their own traps so right. to speak and it's funny that he does the same thing. Right. <laughs> so yeah, but but nonetheless, it's an amazing uh, amazing book and uh, aspiring writers should definitely read this. Sure. Yeah, I totally agree with your recommendation. <laughs> Thank you, Nandini. There Thank was you. a wonderful conversation. That was great. So and, I, you, yeah. you're Delhi only, you said, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll chat, let me. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Nandini. This was a wonderful conversation and uh, I hope we can do this again. Thanks so much, Sandeep. Uh, this was, I really enjoyed myself and I really did not think we would go beyond an hour. So this was great. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you.